The following is an EWTN special presentation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the blessings that you have given us during this conference. The blessings of your Spirit inspiring us to bring these messages about education and freedom and reason and faith into our churches, into our communities, and into our schools. We ask you, Lord, today as we consider this theme of reason and faith, that you help us to see that there could not possibly be a conflict between them because you are the origin and the presence in both. Help us to see the beauty of the universe around us and the beauty and the symmetry and the elegance of the equations of physics that describe them. Help us to see also the human mystery with its underlying desire for unconditional truth, love, goodness, beauty, and being, reflecting your very presence in us. Help us to see the beauty, too, of poetry and of music, of the humanities and literature, and all the different forms that describe your glorious and awesome beauty manifest unconditionally in your heavenly presence. So that in this vision of reason and faith, in the complementarity between them, the unity that exists between them in your essence, we too may bring your spirit passionately to the world. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, and enter the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your wisdom and love. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, as by now is probably apparent, today's theme is about uh, faith and reason. Uh, we have uh, three talks that we're going to be uh, uh, looking at, kind of a wonderful group of people. First, we will be uh, inviting Father Barron back, who gave such a terrific talk yesterday. And he's going to be talking about analyzing the culture and responding uh, apologetically uh, to that culture, particularly uh, in the new media. Uh, we are also going to have, of course, Dr. Peter Kreef, who I don't have to tell any of you, has published more apologetical books than probably anyone uh, in, in the, the last part of the 20th century and the 21st century, and truly has been a force for apologetics uh, in Catholicism. And finally, you are stuck with yours truly again, who will be talking about several areas of apologetics that must be touched touched from science to philosophy, even to historical exegesis, to looking at God and Jesus, and even suffering from the vantage point of faith and reason. So without uh, further ado, I don't need uh, uh, to introduce uh, our speakers again, but I do want to take uh, one more opportunity to introduce uh, one of our sponsors for the co conference, and that is FOCUS, the Fellowship of Catholic University Students. Uh, Majus has a partnership with them. They are truly terrific in bringing the faith on a very deepened level to students at both public and Catholic universities. And today, Grace Del Nero uh, will be speaking on behalf of FOCUS and talking to you about the important, important ministry that they do on our university campuses. Welcome, Grace. Thank you so much, Father. As Father Spitzer said, my name is Grace Del Nero, and I work full-time for FOCUS, the Fellowship of Catholic University Students. And yesterday we spoke about education, and Catholic education is of particular interest to me because it was really not that long ago when I myself was on a college campus. And as a collegiate athlete, I saw firsthand the temptations that college students face. I saw the drugs, the alcohol, and the hookup culture. And there was nothing that was challenging me to rise above. No call to holiness, no call to greatness, yet everything that was driving us away from the Catholic faith. 
And I was determined not only to keep my faith, but also to help my friends. I wanted to be a part of a change for my generation. But I was seeking something more, and I found it in focus. It was exactly for people like me and my classmates and my friends that Curtis Martin started Focus 14 years ago. He and many others, some of you here today, they wanted to be a part of a change for this generation. And Focus is directly responding to our Holy Father's call for the new evangelization. We're doing this on 74 college campuses across the country answering our Holy Father's call for the new evangelization. But the college campus is just the beginning. The ultimate goal of FOCUS is to launch college students into lifelong Catholic mission, a lifetime of Catholic mission. And here's what I mean. When you look at our culture, every point of our culture is in crisis. From the very beginning of life, the moment of conception, to childhood and adolescence, to the breakdown of family and marriage, to the end of life and life issues. When you look at, when you look at the culture, there's a lot of things that we need to fix. And if you had to fix everything, where would you begin? Everything on this is important. None is more important, but one is more leveraged. So when you have to fix everything, you begin with the college years. And why college? Because college, is actually reaching that pivotal decade. We're reaching the students between the ages of 16 and 26 years old, that critical generation, and there's no other time in life that is more open to life changes. It's a time in life when you're asking those big questions. I know that I was. It's a time when you're discerning your vocation, and I still am. It's a time when you are right before you're launched into the workforce, into your profession, into the community and into the parish. It's a critical time, and FOCUS is responding to this critical generation and reaching them, forming them, equipping them right before they go out into the world. We're reaching the parishes and we're sending out shock troops. What do you think I mean by shock troops? I had never heard that term before either, but Dom Chatard shared this very valuable lesson with us in his book, The Soul of the Apostolate. A hundred years ago, he told us that if you have one faithful priest and just a handful of really zealous parishioners, you can revitalize the Catholic parish. And that's what FOCUS is trying to do. We're sending out shock troops. And when you look in the next 10 years, by 2022, we're anticipating that we will have 75,000 well-formed Catholic alumni, 3,000 of which will be priests, sisters, and religious, 72,000 Catholic laity. And when you think about it, it's not an insignificant number because there are 19,000 Catholic parishes across the country, which equates to a four to one ratio. We want to provide the leaven for our parishes so that the parishes can go out and be leaven for our nation. So where are we right now? I've kind of given you a glimpse ahead at where we want to be in 10 years by 2022, but how are we doing to date? Well, I'm thrilled to share with you that we're sending out the greatest number of missionaries next month as the academic year rolls around the corner. We're sending out 364 young, dynamic missionaries. And these people are impressive. They're young, they're faithful, and they love Christ. And they want to bring their peers back to the sacraments. They are well-trained, and they're going out to where, where the college students are. They're going into the fraternities and into the sororities. They're going into the athletic teams, like my team in college. And they're bringing their friends back to the sacraments. With the grace of God, we hope to reach 100 campuses in the next, 10, or in the next two years. So we're going to be breaking that 100 campus goal very soon. We're not an invisible think tank. Rather, we are visible witnesses. We are the hands and feet of Christ, reaching the greatest assembly of future Catholic leaders and sharing with them a message of hope, a message of joy, and a message of authentic friendship. When you think about it, 90% of Catholics attend public universities. And we are at some of these premier state schools. 
Not only are we at the premier state schools, but we're also going to some great universities this next year. I want to give you a sneak preview. We're heading to Harvard, to Baylor, to Northwestern, and to University of Virginia in Arlington. Some of the greatest alumni come from some of these universities, and they're making a direct influence in the culture immediately after they graduate. Focus is forming and fostering wonderful religious vocations, but there's still a lot of work to do. And we have to ask ourselves, who is going to fight this fight against relativism and tarnished values? Where are our future leaders going to come from? It is going to take authentic, virtuous leadership. It's not a time to be comfortable. This is a time for action. Our opposition is engaged. They're spending money and they're gaining momentum. We need to be more faithful, more resourceful, and more committed as we fight this challenge. But ultimately, our challenge is a spiritual one. It's not only for the soul of our nation, but for individual souls. The ch as a church, we need to take bold action. We need to dream big dreams, and we need to set audacious goals. And that's what we're doing with Focus. When Curtis Martin had the pleasure of meeting our blessed John Paul II in 1998, blessed John Paul II looked at him in the eyes, and he shared two important words for us. He said to Curtis Martin, be soldiers. Be soldiers. Not only are we soldiers, but we are assembling an entire army of dedicated young people that are committed to the new evangelization. I'm just one story. I'm just one life that has been committed to the new evangelization. And I'm here with a few of my colleagues today. And we want to share with you the hope, the hope of the future, and the hope of all of these young people that also have committed their lives to the new evangelization and are sharing it with their peers with this most leveraged generation of college students. Thank you so much. Well, you can see not only what faith they have and virtue they have, but also what heroism they have. Uh, there really are our shock troops and our heroic shock, shock troops on college campuses. Thank you so much, Grace. Uh, now, of course, uh, without further ado, we have uh, Father Robert Barron again. Just uh, He's going to be speaking to us about analyzing the culture, and who knows more uh, about the culture than Father Barron uh, because he has a YouTube ministry, he has an internet ministry that pretty much tells him uh, what the pulse of the culture is, and perhaps uh, he can give us some uh, ways of responding to that culture that will make sense in light of deepened Christianity. So uh, once again, uh, Father Barron, it's our honor to have you back on, uh, on the podium here. What a wonderful conference this is. I enjoyed uh, talking to you yesterday and then a lot of the conversations. Then I had a great golf match yesterday afternoon. Again, uh, those who watch me were, were not edified by the play, but at least it was a beautiful day and we had a good time. Uh, Grace, is that your name again? Yes. You should become a Nashville Dominican. I mean, you, should, you would be a terrific. <laughs> No pressure on you at all, but uh, <laughs> I believe in, I am sort of the Elijah Elisha theory, you know, of calling people to, uh, to vocation. You'd be terrific. And Focus is a wonderful group. Some of the best people we have at Mundelein have come out of Focus, either as Focus missionaries or influenced by them. So it's a dynamite movement. So thank you for that. Um, let me apologize in advance to those who maybe read the program and saw I was going to talk about the YouTube heresies. Um, you know, there's a a long conflict between speakers and the organizers of conferences. And it, it goes like this, that many, many, many months in advance were asked, you know, what are you going to speak about? Give us a paragraph. And I bet there are a lot of speakers like me that go, oh, gosh, you know, because there's some talks you've given, you've got them. Other talks you're kind of working on. Other talks you're dreaming about. And you're not quite sure which one you want to give at a conference. So I had talked about the YouTube heresies there, but I did a lot of that actually yesterday in the talk. So what I want to do today, and... I'm going to put my professor hat on a little bit for this one. 
is to talk about the culture under the rubric of liberalism and post-liberalism, or now I mean the same thing by these terms, modernism and postmodernism. My argument in brief is going to be that the postmodern period we're in is actually a hopeful period in many ways for us religious types because it's broken the logjam of modernism, which in many ways um, obviated the work that we want to do. So I want to do kind of a, a history of ideas, an overview of culture, and um, hoping that it helps us to analyze where we are and what we might uh, do. So let me start by talking about a young man in the early 17th century, who was studying at the Jesuit Collège of La Fleche, not too far from Tours. This young man's name was René Descartes. He was receiving at the time probably the best education you could get anywhere in the Western world. The Jesuits were training him in philosophy and the sciences and history and mathematics, etc. But as you know, young René Descartes was not a happy camper. Why? because he wanted certitude. And what he found, as the Jesuits uh, gave him this great survey of the Western tradition, was a lot of confusion in literature, in, in philosophy, in religion. Well, Plato says this, but Aristotle said that. Jerome says this, but Chrysostom said that. Aquinas said this, but um, the Bible said that. It, it appeared to him as though the Western tradition was a hodgepodge of confusion. So young René Descartes leaves La Flèche and said, well, I'm going to travel the world a bit, as young people are wont to do, and I'll try to find out if in the customs and traditions of the nations I can find some coherent unity. And so Descartes traveled and found even more confusion. He found that the customs and traditions of the various nations were at odds. He joined the French army for a time during those interminable wars of religion in the early and mid-17th century. And one day, he snuck away. They're in the town of Ulm. If you want to see where modernity was born, go to Ulm in southwest Germany. Because Descartes hunkered down in what he called a heated room. He never liked the cold. He died of the cold, by the way, up in Sweden. <laughs> he hunkered down in a heated room, and he said, I am not going to come out. He's a bit like a monk here. I am not going to come out until I find rational certitude. His method was a kind of monastic escasis. I am going systematically to doubt anything that can be doubted. So we know that famously from Descartes' method. Sense experience, well, I, this could be a dream. I've been bedeviled by illusion, so I can't really trust my sense experience. I can doubt that. Received ideas and opinions, well, those are a hodgepodge of confusion. They've misled me in the past. I can doubt those religious ideas, philosophical ideas, all of it is subject to doubt. Descartes swung the wrecking ball of systematic doubt all around him and knocked over everything. And then it dawned on him, the one thing he couldn't knock over was the wrecking ball itself. Right? And hence the famous cogito ergo sum, I think. Or better even, dubito ergo sum, I doubt, therefore I am. Descartes found in that little room in Ulm the starting point, his own subjective experience as a thinker and a doubter. Now, here's part of Descartes that people often overlook. On that basis, he now reconstructed his whole intellectual world. I won't go into the details, but he brought back sense experience. He brought back received ideas. He even brought back God. But here's the salient point. He brought them back on the basis of his experience of the cogito. Bringing all these objective things before the bar of the subjective, he established certitude. The first great mark of modernity is, therefore, subjectivism. Subjectivism. My experience becomes the norm of truth and reality. Sound familiar? Ideas have consequences. They trickle down eventually. You hear it everywhere in the culture, don't you? That's not my experience. I've never experienced that. I can't verify that directly in my own experience. That's the fruit of Descartes' first move. 
When he looked around the intellectual tradition, though, he also found this. If there's one system that does seem to have a certain coherency across time, it's mathematics. And of course, Descartes loved mathematics. We all studied the Cartesian coordinate system when we were in high school. What Euclid taught centuries before, we're still teaching in the 17th century. Mathematics seems to have a kind of coherency across time. Therefore, the best method, Descartes said, is a mathematically rational method. The second great mark of modernity, rationalism especially of the mathematical variety. Every single day, friends, on YouTube, my internet ministry, I come across this rationalism. The form it takes today is scientism. It's only scientific and mathematical truth that's verifiable and legitimate. Any other claim to knowledge is a false claim. So subjectivism, rationalism. Here's a third mark now of Descartes' approach. Dualism. Hunkering down in that heated room, what did he find? He found the cogito, I think. And that was clear and distinct and certain. His body, well, that belongs to this realm of sense experience, which can be doubted. That's much more ambiguous, much more dubitable. Therefore, he concluded, the body must belong to a separate metaphysical category than the mind. And the mind is privileged over the body for that reason. The mind is known with greater clarity and certitude. It belongs to a higher metaphysical category than the body. A privileging of the interior over the exterior, I would say, is a mark of Cartesianism. Does that sound familiar? Oh, you know, it doesn't really matter what you do uh, out there in your moral life. It, what matters is what's deep down inside of you. Right? Think of so much of contemporary moral theory that moves just that way. Oh, your actions, I mean, that's one thing. That's the externals. It's what's going on deep down inside of you that matters. That's the typically Cartesian privileging of the interior over the exterior. Fourth quality, anti-traditionalism. How come? Well, as we saw, Descartes surveyed the great tradition and found a hodgepodge, found confusion. Better, he said, therefore, to knock it down and start over again. Now, it's a master metaphor in Descartes, and boy, is it influential up to the present day. He said, the intellectual tradition is a bit like a run-down, rickety old seaside city full of dangerously poised buildings. Better to knock the whole thing down and start over again. How modern that sounds, doesn't it? How we are to this day very tempted by that vision. I always think of um, you know, Thomas Jefferson, who was a Francophile, and the founding of our capital city. Not a city growing up out of a long tradition, but starting from scratch. That's the Cartesian impulse. Doubt the tradition, be suspicious of the tradition, and start fresh. Okay, so the big four, I think four characteristics of the modern approach, Descartes' approach. Subjectivism, my experience measures truth and reality. Rationalism, privileging of the mathematical and scientific. Dualism, a privileging of the interior over the exterior. And anti-traditionalism, Knock the old city down and start again. Okay? Now, that's the first young man I want to tell you about, this early 17th century René Descartes. But now we'll go back a century or so before young Descartes. Let me tell you about another young man. This one's an Augustinian friar in a little town called Wittenberg. And like Descartes, he is bedeviled too by doubt, not about epistemological certainty but about his salvation. I'm talking, of course, about Martin Luther. Am I saved? And when Luther tried in a million ways, almost obsessively, to prove that he was saved, his famous line, if ever a monk was saved by monkishness, I was that monk. So through the sacraments, through the sacramentals, through the spiritual life, through prayer, especially confession, to prove to himself that he was saved. But nothing worked. 
Until finally one day, probably around 1516, they're not sure exactly, Luther had an experience. They call it in the technical uh, language his Turm Erlebnis, German for his tower experience. Luther, and see how like Descartes here, Descartes who moved into the private space of that heated room in Ulm and had the experience of the cogito, Luther retires into the private space of the tower. And there he has this great founding experience of being justified, not by his own works, but by grace through faith. In that great interior subjective experience of being justified by grace through faith, Luther finds salvation. Another link to Descartes. What's one of the watchwords of the Reformation? Sola Scriptura, right? By the Bible alone, by Scripture alone. Do you see how verbal, how, if you want, rational Protestantism becomes? It's an eschewing of much of the visual and sacramental, the exterior, a privileging of the Bible alone. So subjectivism, rationalism. Can you find dualism in Luther? Absolutely. How and where was he justified? In what he called the inner man. And Luther sharply distinguishes the inner man from the outer man. Now, to be fair, Luther thinks the inner man and outer man should be brought into, into uh, coherence. So he thinks that you should try as best you can to bring your outer life into conformity with your inner life. But, but, and I'll watch, watch someone like Billy Graham. What's the dramatic moment? The dramatic moment is not so much played out externally. It's played out internally. Have you heard the word of the gospel? And do you accept it in faith? At that moment, you are saved. Right? And no matter... No matter what you do on the outside, it will not compromise your salvation. Luther famously says, peca fortiter, right? Sin boldly. Now, don't, don't uh, caricature Luther. He wants inner man and outer man to be brought together. But the point is, salvation's happened deep down inside. Finally, anti-traditionalism in Luther? Absolutely, absolutely. He brings all of the church's life before the bar of the subjective experience of salvation and thereby judges it. Is it legitimate? Yeah, in the measure that it confirms or is in, is in line with this inner experience of salvation, sure. In the measure that it's not, it should be jettisoned. I'm arguing here very much in line with Jacques Maritain who said Descartes is but the rational and philosophical expression of the earlier Lutheran moves. Subjectivistic, rationalistic, dualistic, and anti-traditional becomes, I would say, the great marks of the modern. Now, this would be subject for a whole other talk, but look now at much of modern philosophy. Look at Spinoza, look at Leibniz, look at Kant, look at Hegel. You can see these four things in spades. Subjectivism, look at Kant, the famous Copernican revolution. It's not the mind that circles around reality, but reality that circles around the mind. The privileging of these great a priori ideas by which our knowledge of the world is formed. Look at Hegel, and you find there the kind of apotheosizing of the ego, apotheosizing of the self. Look in someone like Nietzsche. What do you find? The will to power. It's the subject's authority that dominates. Now come up into the 20th century. I mentioned it yesterday. Jean-Paul Sartre. Why is he an existentialist? Because existence precedes essence. A fancy way of saying, our freedom and individuality and subjectivity come first. And any value is determined by them. Can you see the very clear trajectory from Descartes all the way up through these figures, even to Sartre? Rationalism, of course, is everywhere in modernity. Look at Spinoza, his whole ethical system predicated upon a sort of geometrical, mathematical 
analysis of, of ethics. Look at the scientism of our own time, and that's the sort of rationalism now run amok. Dualism, look again at Kant. What determines the moral life? Not external activity, but the categorical imperative buried deep within the will. Anti-traditionalism, it's an instinct throughout much of modern philosophy to tear down what's come before and start afresh. Watch how often in modernity, and it's up to the present day, people will say, I've found the method which will now bring clarity. Right? Everybody before, problematic, questionable, but now I've found the great rational method that will show the way forward. You know, a very good example, I don't want to become too polemical here, but a very good example is some of the early historical critics of the Bible. Very often you'll hear them say things like, well, you know, the patristic and medieval traditions, they were just problematic. But now we found la méthode. We found the method to read the Bible, and so we're starting from scratch. That's the Cartesian impulse. Okay, so Descartes, Luther, the four great qualities. Now let me tell you about a third young man. This one living at the very end of the 18th century. He's a Moravian minister, pastor. His ministry is in the great hospital of La Santé, French name, but it's in Berlin. Ministers to the sick during the day, but then at night he goes to the sophisticated salon of Berlin. Think of sophisticated salon today in San Francisco or Chicago or the Upper East Side. Think of uh, authors of The New Yorker and Vanity Fair, th those kind of people. This young man is frequenting these salons and discovering what? In the first great wave of the Enlightenment, a great detestation of religion. Think of Christopher Hitchens' intellectual forebears. They were at these salons, belittling religion as old-fashioned superstition. Well, it bothered this young man deeply. And in response, he wrote one of the most influential books in the history of theology. It's called On Religion, Speeches to Its Cultured Despisers. This young man's name, by the way, is Friedrich Schleiermacher, not as well known as Descartes or Luther, but every bit is influential. Young Friedrich Schleiermacher writes this text, On Religion, and catch the subtitle, how telling it is, Speeches to Its Cultured Despisers. Man, that set the tone for about 200 years of theology. What's our job? Is to explain religion to those that don't like us. Explain religion in such a way that our cultured despisers will find it appealing. Well, what do you find now when you read this very influential text? I've told my students over the years, if you want to understand contemporary religion, that's the book. If there's one book to read, that's the book to read to understand the contemporary religious sensibility. Now watch what he does. Schleiermacher says in that book, religion is not primarily ethics, not primarily metaphysics or cosmology. Religion is based upon a sense and taste for the infinite. We have deep down within us this intuition, this feel for the infinite. And all of religion depends upon and flows from that primary subjective interior intuition. Later on now, in his more mature writing, he refers to this as the feeling of absolute dependency. I mean, right now I'm dependent upon you because I'm, I'm talking to you, you're dependent upon me to some degree, but we're not absolutely dependent upon each other. I'm going to leave, you'll go your separate way, and, and we'll be dependent upon other things. But Schleiermacher said, amidst all these proximate dependencies, there's this one great feeling of absolute dependency upon the power of being itself. That interior subjective intuition is the ground of religion. And he says, famously, now bring all of the tradition before the bar of that experience for adjudication. Is it legitimate? Yeah, in the measure that it confirms or is congruent with that experience. 
Is it out of step with that experience? Then jettison it, get rid of it. Here's the most famous example of that jettisoning. Schleiermacher said that the Trinity is not congruent with the feeling of absolute dependency. Therefore, we should get rid of it. Now, you see the point I'm making. Schleiermacher is the first great characteristically modern theologian. He's following, if you want, the Cartesian method, beginning with inner subjective experience and judging all of tradition on the basis of that experience. Now, here's the thing. Trust me when I tell you, for the past roughly 200 years, the vast majority of Christian theologians, both Protestant and Catholics, have raced down the Schleiermacher Autobahn. <laughs> the road opened up by Schleiermacher, which is a modern road, because why? What's the project? Giving speeches to our cultured despisers. Trying to convince those who don't believe in religion that there's something to it. Can you see now, I'm going to caricature it a bit, but <laughs> coming hat in hand to those who don't like us and take us seriously and saying basically, please, on your terms, I'll try to explain this to you. I would argue the vast majority of Christian theologians, both Protestant and Catholic, have raced down that autobahn. I'll give you just a couple of examples. In the 20th century, early 20th century, Paul Tillich, with Karl Barth, the most important Protestant theologian of the 20th century, begins his theology this way. Religion, he says, is ultimate concern. Maybe some of you remember that language. Tillich was very big, oh, 30, 40 years ago. Um, I'm concerned with you right now. You're concerned, at least roughly, with me right now. But soon we'll move on to other concerns. I, I'll get to the airport and try to find my plane. Those are proximate concerns. But, Tillich said, how like Schleiermacher here, Tillich said, amidst all of those, there's an ultimate concern. That sense or taste for God that feel for the unconditioned. All of religion flows from that fundamental interior experience. Bring everything in the religious tradition before the bar of that experience for adjudication. Now, there's a Catholic version of uh, Tillich, also on the Schleiermacher Autobahn, and that's Karl Rahner. Rahner was the most influential theologian when I was going through school. Um, most of us read uh, the Bible, the great tradition, and it culminated with Karl Rahner. So the usual way to argue was, well, the Bible says this, and Aquinas said that, and Augustine said that, and Newman. And, but Rahner says, and that's where the conversation kind of ended with Rahner. He was the end of the Autobahn. But see, the trouble is, he was on the Schleiermacher Autobahn. Now here's why. Rahner, in, you know, brilliant man, obviously. One of the great geniuses of 20th century theology. But Rahner, in article after article, book after book, begins the same way. Man in the presence of absolute mystery. We have an, watch it again, inner experience of standing in the presence of an absolute mystery. What lures the mind, what lures the will, is this absolute truth and goodness. And I have an inner intuitive experience of it. Rahner begins there, and then in the characteristically Cartesian, Schleiermacherian way, he tends to bring the whole of religion before the bar of that inner experience for adjudication. It's a subjectivism that privileges the interior over the exterior. Now, I'm telling you that story to show you this great trajectory coming up from Luther and Descartes, coming through the theologians, into the present time. Is there a lot of modernity still around? Yes. Modernity hasn't faded away. In fact, I think you can see all four of those elements, can't you, in our common culture today. But there's interesting news on the horizon, and that's the emergence of the postmodern. You probably heard that sort of catchphrase. There's postmodern architecture, postmodern uh, literature, postmodern philosophy, etc. There is indeed a nihilistic form of postmodernism. Read uh, someone like uh, Jacques Derrida. You know, there's no meaning, no truth, everything's deconstructed, etc. There is that. But can I suggest to you, 
there's a more hopeful strain of postmodernism, which amounts to the breaking of the logjam of modernity, that's willing to look beyond those four characteristics, willing to question all four. I'll give you just a little bit of hint of that in the postmodern philosophers. Many postmoderns are deeply impatient with subjectivism. Why? Because it limits us in such a sort of imperialistic way, as though all of truth has to come through this little narrow gate of my inner subjective experience. That's why in postmodern thinker after postmodern thinker, intersubjectivity is emphasized. Lonergan, the great Jesuit philosopher, said, it's not the cogito that matters so much as the cogitamus, right? We think, we think. Thinking with the community, thinking, as Chesterton said, in the democracy of the dead, thinking with the great tradition that came before us. Not the narrow space of the cogito, I think, but the wide, challenging space of the cogitamus. Rationalism, every postmodern questions the tyranny of rationalism. Aren't there lots of non-rationalistic ways of knowing? Aren't there avenues to the truth that are not simply down the narrow road of mathematics and science? That's why postmoderns love the irrational or the non-rational. Dualism, the privileging of the inner over the outer, a lot of postmoderns hate that. And they emphasize the importance of the body. Now here's one I find fascinating. Those who love uh, John Paul II. John Paul II did his doctoral or second doctoral paper on Max Scheler. Max Scheler was in that phenomenological tradition I mentioned yesterday, Dietrich von Hildebrand and others. Scheler's intuition was a lot of our knowledge of moral truth comes not just through the mind, but comes, if you want, through the body. There are these great intuitions and sensibilities in the body that allow us to come to certain moral truth. You know, the deepest ground of the theology of the body actually is there. Before you get to sexual ethics, you get to a deeper place where the body itself becomes a mode of knowing. You know, it was like that very much. Martha Nussbaum, a current uh, professor at the University of Chicago, wrote a very interesting book called Upheavals of Truth. And here she talks about how the body tells you the truth in a way the mind can't. Her example was she was uh, lecturing over in Europe, and she received word while she was there that her mother had died. And she took that knowledge in intellectually. But then on the plane on the way home, her body <laughs> told her how much her mother meant to her. It was the upheaval going on in her own body that taught her a deep cognitive truth. Postmoderns love the body and they want to recover it. Anti-traditionalism, postmoderns love the tradition. There's a strain that's called nostalgic postmodernism, meaning I want to get back to things that modernism helped us to forget. I want to recover parts of the tradition that have been occluded by modernity. Okay. So postmodernism, I think, at least in its more positive strain, can break a certain log jam and open us to a more religious take. Let me do one last move here in this little survey of ideas. There are lots of interesting postmodern or post-liberal theologians. And a lot of them, by the way, were at Vatican II. Think here of Henri de Lubac. Think here of Romano Guardini. You know his, his writings? Read the letters from Lake Como. I know it sounds like a travelogue, but um, these are remarkable texts that Guardini very early in the 20th century wrote where he's criticizing modernity very much along the lines I've been suggesting. Guardini's at Vatican II. A young German theologian called Josef Ratzinger is at Vatican II. Very much, I think, in this post-liberal line. But the great uh, figure, I think, behind and around all of those, and I'm going to close with this, is Hans Urs von Balthasar. I know my friends from Ignatius Press will be happy that I'm closing with von Balthasar. 
But I think he, in many ways, is the paradigmatic postmodern or post-liberal Christian theologian, one who consciously decided not to go down the Schleiermacher Autobahn. Someone asked Balthazar toward the end of his career, what's the difference between you and Rahner? So as I said, Rahner was the dominant figure when I was coming of age. And most people now would say the two greatest Catholic thinkers of the last century were Balthazar and Rahner. So interesting question, isn't it? What differentiates you from Rahner? Here's Balthazar's, to me, fascinating answer. He said, well, Rahner went with Kant, and I went with Goethe. Now, this is within the German thought world, but it's very illuminating. Rahner went with Kant. Kant stands firmly in the Cartesian tradition of beginning with subjective experience, with the a priori, the primacy of the interior and the subjective. All of that is Kantianism. And we saw that's what Rahner did. In book after book, article after article, he began with this inner intuition of absolute mystery. Rahner went with Kant. And I, Balthasar said, went with Goethe. Now, Goethe, you know, is kind of a combination of, of Newton and Shakespeare for the Germans. There's a statue in Chicago. It's on, we call it Gothi Street, by the way, uh, <laughs> Goethe Street. And it's this great statue built by the Germans a century ago, and it's called Goethe mastermind of the German race. Very Germanic way to put it. But that's the way they see Goethe, this, this hugely important figure. Poet, yes. Playwright, yes. Dr. Faustus and all that. Artist, yes. But also, oddly, scientist. Scientist. Goethe hated Newton. How come? He said Newton took reality put it on a table, put a bright light on it, and then dissected it. What he means now is the Newtonian style that he found aggressively rationalistic, forcing reality to answer our questions, to show itself on our terms, to respond to our anxieties and hang-ups. Notice, please, a certain subjectivism. Goethe said, look, if you want to understand a plant, what shouldn't you do? You shouldn't uproot it from the ground, take it to a lab, put a bright light on it, and dissect it. You'll learn thereby data about the plant, but you will not know the living plant. Rather, Goethe said, what should you do? Well, why don't you sit down next to the plant, the living, growing plant? Watch it. Study it patiently. Let the plant ask you its questions. Maybe draw it, as Goethe himself often did. He would draw, draw plans. Let the life of that thing gradually manifest itself to you, and then you will come to know it. You know what's very Goethean, by the way? Remember the, um, the um, um, uh, scientist Jane Goodall? And we watched her programs about the chimps, you know? What bothered Jane Goodall was, well, what did scientists do? They go out, capture a chimp, put it in a net, bring it back on a plane to some lab, or look in a zoo and study it. What will you learn thereby? Certain data about it. She decided, no, I, I'm going to go and live with the chimps. I, I'm going to watch them. I'm going to follow the rhythms of their life. And I'll learn much more truly about them when I allow them to teach me. OK, Balthazar. Rahner went with Kant. I went with Goethe. How do you know Jesus Christ? Well, let's see. Think about the culture despisers, how much they don't like him. And then go into your inner experience and find some general sense of religiosity. And then bring Jesus into line with that subjective experience. Uh-uh, said Balthazar. That's how you'll not know Jesus. You'll now get him, if at all, on your terms. Better, he said, what? Go where he is, where he lives. Sit with him. Watch him. Allow him to question you. Allow the rhythm of your life to correspond to the rhythm of his life. You see what that means? Liturgy and prayer and the Mass and the lives of the saints. 
allow Christ in this Gertian way to reveal himself to you. That's a method I uh, submit to you is deeply non-Cartesian, non-Schleiermacherian. It's a mystical contemplative method that allows the objectivity of Christ to appear. There's more to it, and this I think is a really fascinating point logically. What's the trouble with modern or liberal theology for Balthasar? It doesn't take the prologue to John and the first chapter of Colossians seriously. What do you mean? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. What does that mean? It means that that Word cannot be understood or judged or adjudicated from the standpoint of an alien reason. There is not a logos outside of that logos from the standpoint of which Christ is read. Rather, he is himself the logos who reads us. Colossians chapter 1, where Jesus again is identified as the word in and through which all things exist. What's the one thing, therefore, you can't do? You can't stand outside of that logos and on the basis of some exterior reason come to know him. Rather, you must come to be known by him. Notice how the distinctiveness of Jesus is emerging. The irreducible distinctiveness of this form of life. The danger is a Cartesianism, a Kantianism, a Newtonianism that subjects Christ to our logical analysis, that reads him from the standpoint of our subjectivity. Remember I said yesterday about uh, Iris Murdoch and the good and the beautiful. What does the beautiful do? It changes you. It uproots you. It rearranges you. It changes your mind and heart. The sovereignty of the good, as Iris Murdoch pointed out. Sovereignty. Sovereign over our subjectivity, not judged by it. So Christ, who is supremely beautiful, is the one who rearranges us. Do you see now why Balthazar made the beautiful such a prime category? We don't measure it, it measures us. We don't elect it, it elects us. We don't send ourselves, that's modern autonomy. Rather, the beautiful sends us and elects us. Here's the last point, then I promise I'll stop. Um, One of the major dangers with a modern or liberal theology is it makes evangelization kind of pointless. Now, why? Why? Because what matters finally for the liberal tradition is that grounding experience, ultimate concern, absolute dependency, standing in the presence of absolute mystery, that's what matters. Now, certain events and figures and so on bear that experience, make it real to us. But once they've done that, well, then they become more or less expendable. I've got the experience. The bearer of it becomes less important. But not now on this Balthazarian or Gertian reading of it. Now it's that Christ, that particular Christ, that indispensably dense and complex Christ who has seized me and changed me and awakens continually in me the change that we call conversion. That Christ permanently matters. Not just the mediator of an experience that I can access in other ways, but he's the permanently valuable and objective source of this conversion. See, the problem is if you're a Schleiermacherian, say, well, yeah, Jesus can do that. Jesus can mediate to me the feeling of absolute dependency, but what if the Buddha does it too? What if a Sufi mystic does it too? What if ancient myths do it too? Well then, you know, what's the difference? Why would I declare him? Evangelization depends upon the declaration of him, the indispensability of him, the centrality of him, the one that Balthar called the concretissimum, the most concrete, the most specific. 
I think, friends, finally, that's the problem with this whole strain, beginning with Descartes and Luther, coming up through modernity, coming into modern theology. The major problem is it undermines evangelization. I'd recommend that the postmodern period that we're in actually gives us breathing space. It's actually opened up room. It's broken the log jam and allows us now in a new way to recover this very particular and indispensable Christ. God bless you today and thanks for listening. Once again, another tour de force. Um, you know, talk about getting a toolkit for contemporary hermeneutics for the church all in one 50-minute lecture. I mean, that was really unbelievable. Thank you very, very much, Father Barron. I, I only have one moment of confusion. I've, I've often thought of myself as a disembodied mind. You're dispelling that. <laughs> No, actually, uh, in all seriousness, I mean, we've been really given something, uh, I mean, a gem, a jewel here. And I think uh, those, that little four-part recipe for overcoming the bias of the modern age is something we want to keep in our minds, in the forefront of our minds, just to examine ourselves, but also to examine the world and the culture around us that we really do need a sense of that object revealing itself to us so that we don't become entrapped in our mere subjectivism, that we really do need a sense of the non-rational ways of thinking. The heart has reasons that the mind knows not of, the sense of, 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 of knowledge that comes from love and comes from goodness and comes from beauty, elucidating the rational and making the rational whole. That sense, too, of the definitiveness of embodiment that just in all of its concreteness tells us what the mind in its abstraction cannot possibly know. And the truth we all know that the beauty of the tradition so much elucidates and deepens in all of the other three ways we've talked about what is given to us in the present moment and by modernity. You've really given us a toolkit to help us, Father Barron, and we are deeply, deeply grateful. Well, it... <laughs> we now have uh, our, another sponsor, uh, um, Course Legatus. Uh, I don't have to tell most of you in this room, I was the international chaplain for Legatus for seven years. Uh, John Hunt, a very good friend of mine, is going to talk to us about uh, this important um, uh, organization that brings together Catholic uh, leaders and CEOs uh, so that they can collectively find ways of really helping the culture and also growing in their faith. John? Thank you, Father. Can you imagine the burden I must feel standing up here, attempting to leave a message with you folks after a Father Baron? How blessed we are to have the Father Barons and the Father Spitzers of this world, are we not? You know, it's a, um, it's a real honor for Legatus uh, to be a part of this uh, Napa Institute, this extraordinary second annual event. We were privileged to be here last year. Uh, we have observed the growth, uh, and I suspect that we're only in the early stages of what this is going to mean to the church over time. I particularly want to, uh, I think, acknowledge and say thank you to, uh, to uh, Tim Bush for his perseverance, his fortitude, his faithfulness to the church in bringing this to, to all of us. Uh, it's been a gift, and uh, I would pray that we would come away with, uh, with uh, benefits that we would take back to our, our parishes and to our local churches, uh, because this is a gift for the future. In the few minutes that I have with you, I'd like to just uh, do two things. 
One is to give the, uh, those of you who may not be familiar a brief introduction to Legatus, what it is, what its mission is. And then secondly, spend a little bit of time telling you of, of something un, in some respects unfortunate that we have had to be a part of, namely the filing of a lawsuit against our federal government. I'd like to give you a report on that. First of all, I've come across so many of you who are members of Legatus uh, here attending this conference. I'm curious, could any, would you all give me a show of hands as to those of you who are, <laughs> seems to be about half of, the, uh, half of the room. I'm so pleased and I'm proud that, that you have supported this conference as much as, uh, uh, as, uh, as we have as an organization because we are here representing all of you who are members. But for those of you, who, those few of you who do not know about Legatus, Legatus, having been founded uh, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit by our founder Tom Monahan some 25 years ago, uh, is in the midst of this 25th anniversary celebration. And it is a time of, uh, when we look back and appreciate what we've been given, which is the fact that we have uh, over 4,000 members, 2,000 of whom are, are CEOs of business, uh, business entities who are in a unique position to, um, to be of influence on the culture in a broad way and very much so on those business units uh, for which they're responsible. You know, this isn't something that is, um, um, what would you say, elite in any particular, may be because it's an organization for Catholic business executives. But I like to think of it as something rather similar to the um, U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. Fairly unique, one might say, right? Fairly elite, one might say, because why about Legatus and chief executives, similar to the USCCB? Because only bishops can be members of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. Priests can't, monsignors can't. So that's elite on the one, on the one hand. But it's not elite if you consider what the role of the bishop is and what the role of the business leader is, namely, that each of us as individuals have a responsibility of service to those for whom we're responsible, for those who are our employees, for those indirectly who are the families of those employees and the bigger marketplace. That's for the reason for which we exist. And our mission statement, which is to study and live and spread the faith, is intended to be a vehicle by which all of us can live our spirituality, our lay spirituality in the marketplace in a way that in many respects, many of us hadn't hadn't even considered before our membership in the organization. So it's something that, um, for those of you who are business executives, uh, possibly chief executives of businesses, uh, I would invite you to stop and visit uh, our table. In fact, our, our, some of our, our, our team is here. Paul Blewett is our West Regional Director, and uh, Patrick Novakoski, uh, the Legatus Magazine editor, they're here to answer questions for you. So. Um, uh, we're pleased to be here and be a part of it. Now, this lawsuit. You know, Legatus is um, finding itself in the midst of something that we didn't want to do. Uh, shortly after January 20th, we began communication with our, with our members, letting them know the kinds of things that they could do, communicate, maybe visit with, uh, with their local uh, ordinary, possibly write or visit with their senator or congressman or so on and so forth. I was visiting one of our chapters uh, in early March, uh, and I visited in a subset of the membership, and, and as they went around the room introducing themselves to me and I to them, some of them, many of them said, you know, this idea of visiting the bishop and communicating with the congressman and so on and so forth, I don't have to be a member of Legatus to do that. I mean, I can, I can do that on my own volition and so on and so forth. There's got to be more that the organization can do in this regard. We came back, we convened a meeting of our Board of Governors, an emergency meeting by, by phone of our Board of Governors, and of the 23 governors, uh, who, well, of, the, of our 23 governors, 18 were able to make this, this special meeting in early April. And we came away from that with uh, this decision, this terribly difficult decision, to sue our federal government over our religious freedom constraints, okay? We did that. <laughs> what I am particularly proud of uh, is to be able to say to you that of those 18 governors present, there was not a single negative vote 
in the, in the process of approving this, uh, this uh, action, okay? There was a courage that was expressed there that maybe some or maybe all of you at one point or another in your business futures may find yourselves, okay? Because we are living in a time of, of, of martyrdom, of potential martyrdom. And, and it's going to take courage now because the opportunity may not be there 10 years from now or 15 years from now. The time is now, in this period of time, in many respects, the time is the next 100 days. But beyond that, the culture is being attacked from all sides, and we who are in the marketplace are in a, in a unique position to address that. So we have undertaken this action, unfortunately. Um, we believe uh, that the blessings that we have been given uh, are such that um, if we don't respond now, then we will, we will bear that burden uh, in our next life. So while I uh, congratulate uh, Tim and Father Spitzer for all that they have done for, uh, for our faith, um, I want you to know that I think what's very important is that uh, what we do is what, and what we attempted to do, we had three reasons really for filing our lawsuit. First one was to simply represent those 17 employees of ours, okay, uh, who if we are obligated to provide these kinds of contraceptive services, we will refuse to provide those, and in so doing, we will not provide uh, health benefits to our employees and therefore put us at a, at a disadvantage in the marketplace. So that was our first and principal reason. The second reason is that as an organization of over 2,000 business executives, these are individuals who are managing 2,000 Catholic-led business units. Okay, those business units as a whole uh, are responsible directly or indirectly for over two million employees. We believe that our lawsuit may well do more than any of the other lawsuits, all of which are serving a very specific purpose, the Catholic diocese, the Catholic charities, other, the universities and so on and so forth. We are representing the totality, if you will, of the business community. So I would ask you uh, to, to pray for that. Our third reason for uh, filing suit is that we want, and why we did it in an emergency basis, is that we wanted to uh, send a message to our bishops before they met in their spring meeting in June. We filed our lawsuit on May 7th. We wanted them to know that as they went into session, and of course many of the lawsuits followed on the 21st of May as we did on the 7th of May, we wanted them to know that we, the business community, and business, Catholic business executives were in strong support of them and we would do whatever was necessary. So uh, I, and I guess I, that, that uh, uh, effort on our part was react, uh, reacted to best by a letter I received on June 21st. It says, Dear Mr. Hunt, thank you for your thoughtful letter expressing support for the work of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops in defense of religious freedom. I am especially con con encouraged to hear of your efforts to pursue litigation through the Thomas More Law Center. Your particular voice in defense of the business owner is a unique and important part of the efforts to defend long-held rights of conscience for institutions and individuals. Since the debate over the HHS preventive services mandate began in earnest back in January, we have heard quite a bit about the institutional threats the church faces. But it is good to be reminded that individuals will also be affected by the odious regulations being imposed by the administration. Your witness to the fundamental right to religious freedom provides a sign to our secular culture that men and women of faith will not be silenced. Thank you for your commitment to the rights of conscience and please be assured of my prayers in your efforts. Faithfully yours in Christ, Timothy Cardinal Dolan, Archbishop of New York. We, we consider ourselves to be privileged to have had the opportunity to step forward. I pray that you will, uh, when the opportunity presents itself, will do likewise. Again, once again, I would ask you to stop by our booth. For those of you who are Legatus members, we have copies of our beautiful 25th anniversary book that you might be interested in taking away from this conference. Thank you so much. Well, wonderful just to listen to all these 
talks from our sponsors is like getting a mini course in the new evangelization, so appreciate uh, the efforts of, of all of you. And now uh, we come to uh, uh, kind of a new s section. Uh, we're going to be taking a look uh, from the vantage point of Dr. Peter Kreeft of um, uh, looking at evangelization as a narrative from Scripture beginning with Genesis. Um, Dr. Peter Kreeft is no stranger to anyone, I'm sure. I'm going to venture to say he's published at least 35, maybe 40 books in this area of apologetics, apologetics concerning the church, God, uh, mor morality and ethics, um, and, and virtue. I mean, it's just been a panoply of things in defense of the church. Uh, he has debated many an atheist on television and universities and, and done it so successfully on behalf of the church. He has television series at EWTN. Frankly, uh, the man is omnipresent, uh, except he's not God. But we are sure privileged to have Dr. Peter Kreeft come and talk to us about apologetics and faith and reason from the vantage point of uh, scripture narrative. Come, uh, Dr. Kreeft. My title is The Wonderful But Wild Marriage Between Faith and Reason. And I would like to begin by placing my subject in a large historical context. The marriage of faith and reason is the fundamental intellectual project of Christian culture. Historically, this began with the marriage of biblical Judeo-Christian culture and classical Greco-Roman culture, the two great traditions in the ancient world which have survived and have formed that civilization which used to be called Christendom and is now simply called Western civilization by both its defenders and its cultured despisers and which from the Catholic point of view is most accurately called apostate Christendom. The two most salient facts about this civilization is that it is ours and that it is rapidly committing intellectual and spiritual suicide. We feel a little bit like a child whose mother is killing herself by leaving her husband and whoring after men with toxic drug habits. And if we don't feel like that, that's even worse. It means the child has been drugged too. The marriage of the two cultures was the marriage of two historically new ways of thinking, faith and reason. We often forget how new these two roots of our civilization were in the ancient world. The two languages of these two cultures, Hebrew and Greek, contained many words that expressed concepts that had never occurred to any human mind before, concepts that simply did not exist in any other culture. For instance, barach in Hebrew, which meant to create something out of nothing a feat impossible to nature and to man and to all other gods but the Hebrew God. Another radically new concept was sin, which meant not merely moral evil, but the breaking of the uniquely intimate covenant relationship with God, the relationship that no other culture knew except the Jews. And if you don't understand the intimacy of marriage, you don't understand the suicidal tragedy of divorce. Sin is spiritual divorce. Still another unique Hebrew concept was the revealed name of God, I am. The identification of I with am, of subject with object, of person with being, of a moral will with something eternally perfect. None of these concepts can be found anywhere else in the world. And in Greek culture, we also have unique concepts like science and logic and essence and nature and substance. The radical newness of these two cultures is revealed in two words, the word Gentiles and the word barbarians. The Jews and the Greeks were so distinctive that each of them had a word for all other cultures. All men were either Jews or Gentiles either Greeks or barbarians. There were only two kinds of people, not many. To the Greeks, the Jews were simply one kind of barbarian. To the Jews, the Greeks were simply one kind of Gentiles. 
The single most life-changing and history-changing distinctiveness of these two cultures consisted in two new ways of thinking about everything. These two new ways of thinking were called faith and reason. We who have forgotten history have forgotten how radically new these two things were. Alas, Santayana was wrong when he said that those who have forgotten history are doomed to repeat it. They're not doomed to repeat it. That would be a privilege. Divorcees do not become virgins. <laughs> what were these two new ways of thinking, faith and reason, and how were they radically new? What faith had meant for all Gentile religions was always something private, esoteric, and unverifiable. But what faith meant for the Jews and for the Christians who learned from them was something quite different, something exoteric and public, available to all and demanded of all, expressed not in mystical experiences of shamans, but in words and deeds, the words of the prophets and the public miracles of salvation history. Judaism was not just a new religion, it was a new kind of religion and a new kind of faith. An equally new kind of reason was discovered by the Greeks. What reason or wisdom had meant for all barbarian cultures was the purely practical wisdom that leaked down by osmosis from tradition and authority and was mediated by the authority figures, the seers. Just as faith became public and egalitarian and objective in Israel, reason became public and egalitarian and objective in Greece. When Socrates appeared on the scene and won every argument he ever engaged in because he clearly understood for the first time what logic was and how it had the authority to interpret and judge even the highest traditions of its culture, namely the gods of Homer and Hesiod, he appeared to his fellow Greeks as a new kind of man and such a threatening one that he had to be executed. Any marriage between Gentile religions and barbarian philosophies would have been impossible because there was no common meeting point. Both were irrational, elitist, private, and subjective. But the marriage between Jewish religion and Greek philosophy was possible because both were rational, egalitarian, public, and objective. Both Jewish religion and Greek philosophy affected the whole world, unlike Gentile religions or barbarian philosophies, but only through Christianity and the Roman Empire. Jewish religion affected the whole world through Christianity, which is a missionary religion, unlike Judaism, which does not proselytize until the Messiah comes. Greek philosophy affected the whole world through Rome, which provided the body that carried the Greek soul everywhere after the Greek political body was absorbed into the omnivorous Roman stomach. Rome produced no important new philosophy, but revered the minds of the Greek philosophers even after conquering the Greek body. Throughout the history of Rome, rich parents imported philosophers from Greece to educate their children. Suppose an extraterrestrial sociologist with materialistic leanings had been studying Earth in the sixth century BC. He probably would never have predicted that 99% of the future of the West would depend on these two little postage stamp sized civilizations, Israel and Greece. By the way, that should give us a clue as to how much we should trust our current prophets. <laughs> our first photo of this wedding is in the prologue of John's Gospel. Here we see the wedding night of the marriage and the conception of its embryo. For here we see the two becoming one. Both are called by the same word, logos. The divine sperm is the logos of God the word of God, the mind of God. The human egg is the logos of Greek philosophy. The marriage was like an equation. The logos equals Jesus Christ. St. John identified the very center of classical culture, the logos sought by all the philosophers, the eternal ultimate truth, the meaning of all things. He identified this with the very center of Christian culture, the concrete historical person of Jesus Christ the Logos incarnate, the second person of the Trinity, become this very finite mortal man. When he wrote that the word became flesh, the Logos became sarks, 
human flesh. That meant a human soul and mind as well as a human body. And when John wrote that fateful equation, it was like Einstein's equation of matter with energy. And the energy that was released transformed the world even more than nuclear energy. Jesus equals the Logos. That was not the Hellenization of Christianity. It was the Christianization of Greek philosophy. Because man did not impregnate God, God impregnated man. That is why the God of Christianity and Judaism is never symbolized as she, only he. All of Christian culture is an extension of the incarnation. And philosophy is an essential part of it because philosophy consciously reflects on it and on its meaning seeks its definition and its rational defense. Many great minds contributed to this enterprise, but the greatest of them all, according to the definitive teaching of the church herself, as articulated by the Council of Trent and by almost every single pope since Leo XIII, is St. Thomas Aquinas. St. Thomas answers almost every question by making a distinction. So my second point, after this historical introduction is the distinction between three aspects of the faith reason question. The first aspect takes both faith and reason to be timeless objective truths, the truths knowable by faith and the truths knowable by reason. This is the aspect St. Thomas himself dealt with. A second takes both faith and reason to be temporal, historical, subjective acts of the human soul. This is the typically modern meaning of faith and reason. A third aspect takes faith and reason to be large, collectively human, historical entities, like Adam and Eve, whose names refer both to historical individuals, our first parents, and also to all mankind throughout history. Thus, St. Paul does not say that we are punished for another man's sin, but that we all sinned in Adam. Kierkegaard says somewhere, if the theologians knew everything that the Holy Spirit meant uh, when he inspired uh, the writers of the New Testament to use that little word in, they would have no mysteries left. The first of these three meanings of faith and reason is what St. Thomas dealt with at the beginning of both of his summas when he asked about the relationship between faith and reason. And he meant by these two things, two ideal objective entities or essences, rather than historical, actual, concrete human acts, whether individual or cultural. Thus, faith means all the truths we can know by faith, and reason means all the truths we can know by reason. St. Thomas then asks the question how these two kinds of truth or sets of true propositions are related to each other. And that is a very easy question to answer, and also a happy, clean, bright question. And St. Thomas gives, as usual, an easy, happy, clean, and bright answer to it. It is an objective and ideal question, typical of the pre-modern mind, which is like the mind of a child who keeps asking, what's that? What's that? My first child, a precocious, hyperactive boy, uh, once he learned language, ran around the house and then around the world, pointing to things, saying, what that, what that, what that, what that? <laughs> Thomas's answer is twofold. First of all, there can never be any contradiction between any truth known by faith and any truth known by reason, because truth never contradicts truth, and because God is the author of both, and God never contradicts himself. The medievals loved to say that God wrote two books, scripture and nature, and nature meant also human nature and natural reason. Both, rightly interpreted, are true. Therefore, there has never been and can never be any real contradiction between any divinely revealed Christian doctrine and any truth discovered by human reason, by science, by history, by philosophy, by common sense. All apparent contradictions are based on errors, and those errors can always, in principle, be unmasked and corrected by human reason, because they are errors of reason. God makes no errors. Thus, the supposed conflict between science and religion has no more real existence than zombies. The second part of St. Thomas's answer is that these two sets of truths are partially independent 
but overlapping, so that some of the truths of faith, like the Trinity, cannot, in principle, be understood or discovered or proved, the three acts of a mind, by unaided human reason. But others, like the existence and unity and goodness of God, can. And that some of the truths of reason, like the discoveries of natural science, uh, do not form part of divine revelation, but that other truths of reason, like the order of the universe and the uniqueness of man, do form part of divine revelation. So there are three kinds of truths. Truths knowable by faith alone, truths knowable by both faith and reason, and truths knowable by natural reason alone. This is a very reasonable answer. It is one of five logical possibilities, for there are only five possible answers to questions about the relationship between any two classes, separation, identity, assimilation to the first class, assimilation to the second class, or partial overlapping. And all four of the other logical possibilities here, all four alternatives to St. Thomas's overlapping answer are unreasonable. The total separation of faith and reason denies the middle mixed category. The total identity of the two denies the independence of each from the other. The total subordination of faith to reason denies any independence to faith. And the total subordination of reason to faith denies any independence to reason. Now this was a very short summary of St. Thomas's answer to the question of the relationship between faith and reason. There is no better answer to the question as he conceived it. But there are other questions, that is, other ways to conceive the question. A second way to conceive the question is to mean by the relationship between faith and reason the lived relationship between the exercised act of faith and the exercised acts of reason within the personal history and life and psychology of an individual. That is a much less easy question and also a much less happy, bright, and clean question to answer. It is complex, problematic, dark, mysterious, and messy. It is a question for psychologists, not philosophers. It is a typically modern question, since the typically modern mind tends to be subjectivistic and psychologistic, relativistic and individualistic, it, like the mind of a teenager, <laughs> which keeps asking not what's that, but who am I? And since I am no longer a teenager, I will not delve into this aspect of the question here. But we could also mean a third thing when we ask about the relationship between faith and reason, and that is what I want to explore today. That is, the historical epoch of the changing relationship between these two things in the life of mankind on Earth. This is a subjective and psychological question, but it's not individualistic. And it also shows a clear pattern, rather than being messy and relative to different individuals. Much has been written about the first two aspects of the faith-reason relationship, so I'd like to sketch at least a big picture outline of this third neglected aspect for the rest of my talk. In order to do this, I will personify these two things, faith and reason, and make them protagonists in an allegorical drama I will give them human names. To be very, very original, I will call them Adam and Eve. There are no two more original names than these. Often the key to being truly original is to ignore the demand to be original. And often the key to, be, to being symbolic rather than allegorical, that is, to have a resonating sounding board of many echoing meanings, rather than only one correct meaning, like the solution to a puzzle in an allegory, sometimes the best way to do that is to invent an allegory, which turns out to be a symbolism. I will also dare to be sexist, and I will identify Adam with reason and Eve with faith, because I think it is very obvious to everyone not corrupted by politically correct ideology that men and women are different, and that men tend to value reason more than women do, and that women tend to value faith more than men do. There are thousands of devastatingly accurate and therefore devastatingly funny jokes about that. <laughs> but I will mention none of them here, so that some of you will come to my breakout sessions if you want to hear some <laughs> terrible male and female chauvinist jokes. 
Adam and Eve have gone through three stages in their life so far in history. These are the three stages of every story ever told. The essential structure of story as such. In all stories, a situation is first set up, then upset, then reset in some way, either happily or unhappily or both. Theologians call these three stages not set up, upset, and reset, but creation, fall, and redemption. All three are already present in the third chapter of Genesis. The first of these three stages is the perfect primordial unity, or marriage, between Eve and Adam, that is, between faith and reason. This historical era ended with the fall. But it must have been a real historical era, whether it lasted a day or a millennium. For if it was not, then the good God must have created mankind already in the stage of sin, evil, separation, and divorce, which is absurd. In this first stage, the creation of mankind perfect in Eden, all the things that St. Thomas claims to be true in principle, or de jure, about the relation between faith and reason, are also true in practice, de facto. Four of these are as follows. First of all, Adam and Eve, reason and faith, look at each other with wonder and respect. They are in love. They find each other beautiful. They have faith in each other, and therefore they understand each other's reason. In the second place, they are fit for each other, like a jigsaw puzzle. They are complementary. They complete each other. Adam calls Eve, flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. First, woman is taken out of man, and subsequently every man is born by being taken out of woman. Adam and Eve, reason and faith, perfect each other. Reason makes faith more profound, and faith makes reason more profound. Third, the two become one without losing their two-ness, their difference. Adam and Eve, reason and faith, are neither confused nor separated, but overlapping, so that each has something the other does not have and gives it to the other. Thus, many truths known by reason are not known by faith, and many truths known by faith are not known by reason. And yet the two are one, because all truth forms a whole, as men and women do. The image of God, according to Scripture, is Adam and Eve together, all humans, male and female, are gods, and all truths, both truths of faith and of reason, are God's truths. Finally, there is no possible contradiction or warfare between the two, between faith and reason, or between Eve and Adam, when both are in their innocent, ideal, and natural state. How could there be? God is the author of both, and there is no warfare in God. The second stage is the fall. First, the fall of faith, then the fall of reason, then the fall of the marriage between them. Just as in Genesis, there is a threefold fall, first of Eve, then of Adam, and then of the relationship between them. It is significant that faith falls first, then reason, because that is also the order of their restoration. And that restoration begins with a woman, Mary, the new Eve, the Church Father's first title for her. The cause of the spiritual divorce between Adam and Eve was their spiritual divorce from God, who was the source of their union. Once they fell from God, they immediately fell from each other, from their marriage. They hid from each other because they hid from God. They passed the buck by blaming each other because they both blamed God. Adam blamed God for giving him Eve, and Eve blamed God for allowing the snake in the grass. And in the history of Western thought, too, as we shall see in a few minutes, faith fell first, then reason, then the marriage between them. All four features of the marriage that we observed in stage one are reversed by the divorce in stage two. First, it all begins not with trust, with methodical faith, but with methodical doubt, with the hermeneutics of suspicion. In Eden, it began with Eve's distrust instead of trust in God. The fall was first of all a fall of faith, of trust, 
doubting God and suspecting that perhaps the devil was the more trustable truth teller. The devil was the inventor of the world's oldest profession, advertising. You see this apple, you need this apple. Then Adam followed Eve down instead of leading her out and up. The same happened to the faith and reason historically. Once faith fell, reason fell too. As they had stood together, they fell together. And when they fell together, they fell apart. And this is the second aspect. Instead of complementing and completing and perfecting each other, they weaken and threaten and rival each other. Each blames the other and each blames God. Each seeks autonomy from the other because each seeks autonomy from God. Thus in history, reason begins to see itself as self-justifying, as foundational, as in Descartes. And the results of this rationalism is paradoxically the crisis of reason in modern philosophy. And faith also begins to see itself as self-justifying, as a world unto itself, as a human psychological experience or feeling without a necessary divine object, as in Schleiermacher or Rousseau. And this is as self-destructive to faith as reason's attempt at self-justifying autonomy is to reason. Faith in faith replaces faith in God. You can't sell faith in faith to real people, only to professional theologians. <laughs> like the theologian in C.S. Lewis's story who died and met God and God gave him a choice between entering heaven and entering a theology lecture about heaven. Of course, he chose the lecture. <laughs> a third fall is that the two parties no longer overlap, nor do they respect each other's autonomy and domain and individuality. Their areas are confused and fought over. Each attempts to shrink rather than expand the domain of the other. Thus, religion becomes suspicious of philosophy and of science and trashes their authority. And science and philosophy do the same to religion. And that is the most obvious difference between medieval and modern philosophy. And finally, the so-called war between science and religion dominates modern history. Each seeks to debunk the other. They see each other as enemies instead of spouses. This so-called war between science and religion, by the way, is a total myth and an impossibility if we assume only one premise, namely that atheism is false. The necessary presupposition of this mythical war is atheism. For if there is a God, a God who is not either stupid or wicked and therefore does not tell lies, then faith and reason can never contradict each other, as St. Thomas said. Only if either faith or science lie can there be any contradictions, any war between them. And it must be that faith lies then, since neither side claims that science lies. Though philosophy can lie and disguise itself as science, as in evolutionism, as distinct from evolution. The result of the divorce between faith and reason is the death of both. Without faith, there is no faith in reason, so reason dies. And without reason, there is no reason for faith, so faith dies. The attempt to ground reason in itself in modern philosophy resulted in the present crisis of reason, each wave of the storm more destructive than the one before. Cartesian universal methodic doubt, Humean empiricism, Kantian idealism, romanticist subjectivism, existentialist individualism, moral relativism, logical positivism, linguistic deconstructionism. Every one of these philosophies, though contradictory to each other in the direction towards which they move, are alike in the direction from which they move. They are all part of the grand strategy to dismantle the cathedral in which the marriage of faith and reason is celebrated. They love different things, but they all hate the same thing, medieval philosophy, especially St. Thomas Aquinas. And the rebellion of faith against reason has been as destructive to faith as the rebellion of reason against faith has been to reason. The attempt to ground faith in itself imminently rather than transcendently, anthropologically or psychologically rather than ontologically and theologically, this attempt has resulted in the collapse of faith in liberal and modernist theology. 
the preening overconfidence and hubris of both parties has become its opposite, a skeptical crisis of confidence. Autonomy has proved to be suicide. Now this second stage, the fall or the divorce, does not last for any time at all in the Genesis account without the third stage beginning. As soon as the fall happened, God began its undoing, the redemption. A process that began in Eden, was consummated on Calvary, but will not be complete until the parousia, the apocalypse, the last judgment, the end of time. Everything between that now and then is a mop-up operation. Until then, we Catholics continue to obey the command of our first pope, St. Peter, who told us, be ready to give a reason for the hope that is in you. That is, do apologetics. Apologetics shows the compatibility of faith and reason, Eve and Adam. Apologetics is marriage counseling. Adam and Eve must reconcile. They are meant for each other. If Adam and Eve doubt this, they must be persuaded otherwise by these marriage counselors who are called Christian apologists and Christian philosophers. There have been many such heroic marriage counselors. St. Justin Martyr, St. Augustine, St. John Damascene, St. Anselm, St. Bonaventure, St. Thomas Aquinas, Blessed Duns Scotus, Pascal, Kierkegaard, Dostoevsky, Newman, Chesterton, C.S. Lewis, John Paul the Great, all are fingers on God's reconciling hands. Well, so much for history, for the past. What of the present and the future? I've been telling a double story here, a story about Adam and Eve, man and woman, and a story about faith and reason. That was my allegory. That makes it just two stories, but it's really four stories because the second of the two historical eras, the stage of the fall, means two things. It means all the time since Eden, but more specifically, it means modern times, a kind of a second fall. In this last scenario, the Middle Ages are a little bit like Eden in that faith and reason and the marriage between them was at least much stronger. All three have been getting weaker for the last 500 years. The same is true of the relation between men and women, by the way. Men have become less manly, women less womanly, and their relationship less marital, as modernity has worn on. All that sounds very pessimistic. But remember, the stage of redemption begins to be at work as soon as the fall happens. If the last 500 years have been a deeper fall, can we expect a return or a rise? Do I see the immediate future as better or worse for faith and for reason and for their marriage? And while we're playing the prophet, what about the future of masculinity and femininity and marriage itself? Well, I'm not a prophet, but I do not see our culture, either in the West in general or in the United States, as heading back or up, but rather forward and down. It's not inevitable, but that's the direction it is now heading. Gay marriage, transsexualism, unisexualism, the feminization of men, the masculinization of women, the secularization and trivialization of sexuality and marriage show no signs of turning or diminishing in our culture. But they do show such signs in the church, especially since divine providence has provided us with the church's deep answer to the sexual revolution, John Paul the Great's Theology of the Body which has been a seismic shift in the tectonic plates of sexuality. They're very templates. And less spectacularly, but just as really, there has been a revival of theological and liturgical orthodoxy and of a personalistic version of Thomistic philosophy, also associated with John Paul the Great. So it seems to me that as our culture is becoming more toxic, the church is becoming a more potent antidote. If this is true, if the bad keeps getting worse and the good keeps getting better, what great conflicts does this bode for our future? I cannot forecast their specific identity, but I think they will likely continue to center on these two themes, the marriage of the sexes and the marriage of faith and reason. Our current culture war between the culture of life and the culture of death is not something new. It began in Eden. It has been the central theme of all of our history. Augustine told us that. The culture of life is the culture of marriage. For life to go on, there must be marriage. If there is no marriage, there is death. 
And that's true intellectually, marriage for faith and reason, as well as biologically, marriage for Adam and Eve, man and woman. That is why Mulieris Dignitatem and Fides et Ratio are two encyclicals every Catholic should read. The struggle today between those who, like the Catholic Church, teach the total harmony and complementarity of faith and reason, as well as of men and women, versus those who directly or indirectly teach an opposition between these two, this struggle is a key part of the spiritual war between the two cultures of life and of death, which is the meaning of all of human history. That's exactly Augustine's theme when he wrote the world's first and greatest philosophy of history, the city of God. He called them two cities, we call them two cultures, we're talking about exactly the same thing and the same war. As scripture tells us, this is a war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of wickedness in high places in the heavens. But its weapons are flesh and blood, ours and Christ's. It is really a war between two wars, between the devil's war and God's war. The devil's war is a war against neighbor, self, and God. God's war is a war against the world, the flesh, and the devil. The devil wants you to make peace with the world and the flesh and the devil, and God wants you to make peace with neighbor, self, and God. So the weapons of the devil's war are greed, lust, and pride where the weapons of God's war are poverty, chastity, and obedience. The war between these two wars is really the war between war and peace. I thank God for the privilege of fighting a little bit in this war on the intellectual area of the battlefield. I see many much holier warriors fighting on other areas of the battlefield. Exorcists, saints, popes, priests, spiritual directors, as well as honest and honorable lawyers, politicians, artists, storytellers, musicians, filmmakers, business persons, social workers, cops, soldiers, nurses, surgeons, psychiatrists, farmers, and comedians. These are all military vocations. There are many different areas of the battlefield, but there is only one war, because there is only one God, and whoever is not for him is against him. And however long it takes, and however numerous the casualties, the outcome of this war is as inevitable as a tautology, because God is God. That is the supreme certainty of both faith and reason. God bless you. Dr. Crave, we thank you for that really penetrating analysis, not only of culture, but of our purpose as leaders within the church. Um, we started this conference off with three talks from Dr. Timothy Gray and uh, Bishop Morlino and Archbishop Chaput, and all of them had at the center of the analysis of religious liberty this idea of how important transcendence is to us as human beings having our divine dignity and how important God is to culture, as you have made so clear. There is one war, and that is whether God exists or doesn't exist in our culture, and everything else will be determined by that. The fundamental reality of God's existence and the problem of its denial is, of course, the stem of the entire culture war whether it manifests itself as the separation between faith and reason, or it manifests itself as the separation between the sexes, or manifests itself as the separation between secular and religious culture, it is all the same war. And of course, that is why, as bo both Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI have exhorted us we have to bring religion back into the picture for our culture. We have to bring God back into the, 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 the culture, bring Jesus Christ back into the culture, because if we fail to do that, then of course, as we just heard, 
it will be so difficult to have any objective sense of morality, Pope Benedict's point, and of course, to Dr. Kreef's point, it will be impossible to have a blending of faith and reason, a blending of cultural, uh, of, of uh, the sexes in, in, in our culture, and of course, which is the recipe for sanity instead of the culture's current track to insanity. You've given us the challenge, Dr. Kreeft, and we are exceedingly grateful for it in profound ways that uh, honestly, most of us have never even thought of before. Thank you very, very much once again. Thank you.